grace, mercy, and peace. They are yours. From God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. The sermon this morning is based on what we heard in Genesis chapter 3. You look at all the problems in the world. The famines. The plagues. The wars. And you think, this is just what happens. People fight with each other. Disease creeps out and affects many. You look at the problems in your own life and you think, this is just happening to me. Why is this happening to me? On our own, we would just think, yes, it is random chaos. A chaotic world in which we live that feels like riding the stormy waves of the sea. But the Bible reveals to us that it's not just random chaos. There actually is someone behind it. At the risk of sounding like a 1990s SNL sketch, it's Satan, the devil. The devil is a master of disguise. He doesn't present himself as the big bad. He does not show up as the red guy with goat horns and goat hooves like you may see him depicted. In fact, that depiction of him is only about 200 years old. The Bible does not describe the devil's appearance except to say that he disguises himself as an angel of light. But other than that, the Bible doesn't describe the devil's appearance. That's clever on his part. If he showed up as the big bad, people would know to avoid him. I'm not going over there. I'm not going to talk to that guy. But if he disguises himself as something else, then maybe he can appear harmless. That's why in Genesis 3, he disguises himself as a serpent. Even though he's not called the devil here, we heard in Revelation 20, him identified as that ancient serpent. Now, I'm not much of a snake fan myself. When I was younger, they would always kind of scare me, and now they give me the heebie-jeebies today. But Adam and Eve wouldn't have had a problem seeing a serpent. They were living in a world without sin, without fear, without death. No animal could harm them. They were the rulers of creation. Even if it was a little strange that the serpent was talking to them, well, this world was not that old yet. Maybe they just hadn't seen something like this before. But the serpent was ready to sink his fangs into him, them. God gave them a beautiful place to live, the Garden of Eden. He had allowed them to eat the fruit from any tree in the garden except for one, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. The devil came as a serpent, questioning God's words and God's motives. Did God really say, God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. The snare was laid. Adam and Eve fell right into it. Eve took the fruit from the tree and ate from it. Her husband, who was with her, did not stop her. She handed the fruit to him, and he ate from it too. With that bite, sin and death entered the world. Adam and Eve became ashamed of their nakedness. They became afraid of God. They tried to hide from him when he came to visit later in the day. The devil's attack was threefold. First, it was an attack on their faith. 
The devil tempted them both to disobey God. He tempted them with the promises of being like God himself, of knowing both good and evil. Ironic, because up to that point, they knew good. All that was left to know was evil. But it was the thought that God was keeping something from them. Something he owed them. The devil even got them to doubt God's love for them. The consequences of their sin would affect them individually as well. Eve would have pain in childbearing. The ground that previously presented its fruits to Adam would now hold back its fruits, protecting them with thorns and thistles. Both would die. The second attack was on their family. Until now, they lived in perfect harmony as husband and wife. When God introduced Eve to Adam, Adam broke out in song. This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, for she was taken out of man. But now each was ashamed to be seen by their spouse. When God asked Adam what happened, Adam blamed his wife for getting them into this mess. And he blamed God too, the woman you put here with me. God told Eve that one of the consequences of their sin would be strife and struggle in the family. They could no longer live in their family home. They were kicked out of the Garden of Eden. And there would be residual effects as well. Their firstborn son would murder their secondborn. The third attack was on their church. In the beginning, there were two people on earth. Both believers, 100%. They lived in perfect harmony with God and each other, not just as fellow human beings, not just as husband and wife, but as fellow believers in the God who created the heavens and the earth. Now that harmony became a cacophony. The relationship between God and humans, that was broken. Sin marred the interactions between believers, even though they would share the same faith in God Adam didn't just blame his wife, he blamed a fellow child and creation of God. Even people among the family of believers wouldn't be immune to the attacks of the devil. The enmity that God spoke of between the devil and humankind has persisted. In a lot of ways, the devil is a one-trick pony. He attacks faith, family, church. But again, in a lot of ways, the devil doesn't need to be anything more than a one-trick pony because his one trick works. Now again, the devil likes to disguise himself. He doesn't show up as the big bad. He doesn't even show up as a talking serpent because that would be too obvious at this point. Instead, he likes to show up invisibly. He shows up in the lies of the world. He pokes and prods your sinful nature into disobeying God, into reacting. More often than not, he does not reveal himself but prefers to stay hidden. But he does go on the attack. He attacks your faith. He comes with that same lie. Did God really say? Did God really say you weren't supposed to do that? Surely there must be some loophole, some exception. God isn't taking the whole picture into account. He'll understand that your circumstances, your situation is unique. And you really have no other choice. I can understand why other people shouldn't be allowed to eat the fruit But if you don't eat the fruit, what's going to happen to you? God's just being unfair. He's not giving you everything. He's holding back something good.
what fruit does the devil dangle in front of you? Is it hurting other people, either with actions or with words? Maybe in the heat of the moment. Is it sex and lustful desire outside of the bounds of marriage? Is it something someone else has that you want for yourself? Is it spilling the tea or sharing hot goss, talking about someone behind their back? Is it disrespecting your parents or someone in the government? People that God has put in authority over your life. Surely God will understand why you of all people should get to eat the fruit. Otherwise, he's just being unfair. He also attacks your faith by dangling a different sort of fruit. A fruit of doubt. He counts on your eyes being open to the evil that persists in this world. Evil in your life, financial worries, health problems, relationship breakdowns. Evil in the world, wars, plagues, famines, death. Did God really say? Did God really say he's a loving God? Did God really say he's almighty? Nah. You don't really believe that. Do you? He also attacks your family. And through your family. He sows the seeds of strife between husbands and wives. How many times have you found yourself playing the age-old blame game? He uses the world to influence children and cause disharmony in the family. He influences parents to neglect their families and love themselves more than they love the rest of their loved ones. He uses the sins you're guilty of to drive a wedge between you and your family. He knows well that a house divided against itself cannot stand. His hope is, is that as your family falls apart, so does your trust, your faith in God. He also attacks the church. Our daytimers, we've been studying the book of Revelation, and we haven't gotten to chapter 20 yet, but we've been studying it for the last two and a half years, and we've learned time and time again that false teaching doesn't just arise out of nowhere, this teaching that goes against God's truth, but that it comes from the devil. It comes from hell itself. He influences people's hearts to believe lies that are completely false, or half lies that are only somewhat false. He not only influences church leaders, but also church members. And he uses those lies to divide God's people from the truth and from each other. But false teaching is not his only tool. Since the church is an assembly of people made holy by Christ and yet still battling against the sinful nature, sin creeps even into the church. And with sin comes offense, harm, pain, heartache, division. The devil will do his worst to make church a place you don't want to be so that you are cut off from hearing God's word and from receiving his supper so that you will be cut off from the encouragement of your fellow believers as we await the approaching day of salvation. Just because the devil attacks our faith, family, and even our church doesn't mean we're excused either. Just as Adam and Eve were not excused. For one thing, the devil is not behind every attack. We're pretty good at tripping and falling on our own. 
And for another, as Christians, we're told to resist the devil. We're not his puppets. We don't have to do what he says. We don't have to listen to his lies about whether God loves us and forgives us and will do what's best for us. We don't have to give up on our home families or our church family. And yet when he comes whispering in our ears, we often easily capitulate to his manipulation. We doubt God's love. We blame our loved ones. We resent our brothers and sisters. The devil's influence is so strong. How will he not win? If the people living in paradise couldn't resist him, how will we? How will he not ultimately destroy our faith, our families, our church? How will he not accomplish his goal of dragging us down to hell to suffer with him forever? The devil can't win because he's already lost. God promised a hero to Adam and Eve who would crush the serpent's head. That hero stepped on the scene thousands of years later. The hero battled the forces of hell head on. He drove out demons left and right, even legions at a time. The hero tied up the strong man in people's hearts with his lasso of truth and plundered it of the devil's wickedness. But the devil was not done. Though the hero could drive out demons, heal people's illnesses, teach them about God's love, the devil still had one trick up his sleeve, one tool in his toolbox. He still held the power of death. For all their sins, people would die, and if no hero would save them, they would belong to the devil forever. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the devil's work. Since the children have flesh and blood, he too shared in their humanity so that by his death, he might break the power of him who holds the power of death, that is the devil, and free those who all their lives were held in slavery by their fear of death. This hero was the Son of God himself. Just as God promised to Adam and Eve, he was one of their offspring, the Son of God in human flesh. He took the name Jesus, Savior. The only way to break the devil's power of death was to submit himself to death as an innocent sacrifice. Then no longer could the devil hold our sins against us. No longer could he point the finger and say, they deserve to die! Because Jesus' death broke the devil. And yes, even now, the devil tries to destroy your faith, your family, your church. But Jesus is still your hero. The devil was defeated on Good Friday. His power over you is broken. He can't hold death as his threat anymore. He will always lose. Jesus will always win. Jesus' victory over the devil is God's proof of love for your faith. That he does give you everything you need and doesn't hold back. That he will work all things for your eternal good. Jesus' victory is the salve of healing for your family. No longer does one person need to blame the other as if to make excuses in front of God. Instead, 
bring the divisions, the hurt, the sin to Jesus' cross where he forgave them all when he crushed the serpent's head. Jesus' victory is the bond of fellowship for your church. He has freed us from being captives to sin and made us wholly captives to himself. Whatever pain has been caused, whatever offense has been given, whatever heartache has been wrought, we bring it to the place of Jesus' victory to receive his forgiveness so that we might forgive each other. Just a few verses after what we read in Revelation today, we hear about the devil's end after that little hour that he has. The devil who deceived them was thrown into the lake of burning sulfur where the beast and the false prophet had been thrown. They will be tormented day and night forever and ever. The devil's punishment is coming and his defeat will be complete. And with his defeat, with his end, comes the end of his attacks on your faith, your family, and your church. No longer will he attack your faith. No longer will he go after your family. No longer will he seek to destroy your church. Then your faith will turn to sight. And you will win. Standing at Jesus' side and him standing at yours, no matter what happens, you will win. Because Jesus always wins. Amen. Please stand. And now the peace of God, which is better and beyond all of our understanding, guard our hearts and our minds through faith in Christ Jesus. We join to confess our Christian faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell.